Hey everyone, the name is Eric Thor, and in today's video we're talking about Carl Jung's book, Psychological Types. What you learn in this video is the core message from Jung in this book, why he wrote it, and why you should read it, and how it can help you in your personal life. Okay, first of all, Carl Jung believed, felt that his book, Psychological Types, had come to be deeply misunderstood. In his introduction to the Argentinian edition, he writes quite clearly that, to him, this book was meant to be an introduction and a foundation to critical psychology. What he was trying to do was describe different psychological forces in our consciousness and how they wrestle over power in our mind and how we can understand these forces and use them to understand people around us. Carl Jung warns against using his work to categorize people into different distinct personality types. He calls these some of these typical variations that can occur. And he goes far to say that I can't give an example of a specific person because I don't want to understand people as a specific person. He believes that every single person, every single individual is unique and that a personality type can only be a best fit kind of type. And he uses types as a way to introduce and start the search and desire to understand the human mind. He does not claim that his work is complete. He claims that it's an introductory work and he wants it to be the starting point of an investigation into how the mind really works, how do we make decisions, how do we think, how do we feel, how do we orient ourselves around the world, and how can we understand this kind of orientation. Still today, a lot of people cling to the idea of personality type in an almost compulsive manner, trying to fit themselves in a category. And if you're trying to read this book in order to find out which personality type you are, this book probably won't be able to help you. Instead, what this book is going to give you is something very, very different. So. If you go to the book, Carl Jung will begin to outline his idea of introverts and extroverts. After that, he'll move on to describe intuitive sensors, feelers, and thinkers. In many parts of the Myers-Briggs community, people say that the dichotomies, introverts, extroverts, intuitive sensors are superficial, and that we should only categorize people based on their use of distinct cognitive functions. However, Jung started out with describing introversion and extroversion as he believed it was the most foundationally important category and way to describe how we orient ourselves around the world. To him, the idea of understanding introverts and extroverts was of central importance and secondarily it was also important to study feeling, thinking, sensing, and intuition. And then, third, after you had learned and understood those basics, you could move on to start understanding how introversion and intuition, for example, might combine to a unique orientation, a unique functional way of understanding the world around you. So, don't reject the basics or the foundational work of Carl Jung's theory. Use it and recognize its foundational use. It's the basic building stone. And this is what you want to introduce when you talk about personality type. When you meet a new person, you don't want to go straight to the cognitive functions. You want to make sure people first understand the basics before you can move on to more intermediate, more advanced interpretations and applications of his theory. Still, what can we take away from his definition of introversion and extroversion? Well, first things... He claims this is not an analytical work. This is actually an empirical work. Carl Jung came to the idea of introverts and extroverts through his interactions with patients. What he would come to notice when he analyzed his patients was that some of his patients had in their own psychological world, in the map that they had of the world and how it works, come to give the object a central importance. Other people had come to give the subject a central importance. So a patient might come into a study and they might say that I have been feeling very bad lately and I've struggled a lot with negative feelings and doubt about myself and my thoughts. And it has made me hard, it's hard for me to relate to and connect with other people. And Jung would understand this as an introverted orientation, a framework of seeing the world. 
another patient might come in and say, hey, I have been having struggles with dating lately. I have been trying to find a partner and I find that nobody really likes me and that I'm not funny enough and I'm not charming enough and I'm not really able to get along with other people. And Carl Jung would understand these struggles as struggles with the extroverted psychological force or the object. So when a person focuses on objective circumstances, like for example, their access to money, their need for a job, or their need for resources, or status, or social approval, or a partner, or to be liked, right? These will all be extroverted motivational forces or ways of looking at the world. On the other hand, if a person places primarily emphasis on their own subjective views, oh, I have a project I want to start on, I have a book I want to write, I have an idea in my head that I've been thinking about, I have had a feeling I've been wrestling with for a long time, I've been trying to develop a certain set of skills or abilities, and I've been struggling in developing these skills and abilities. Carl Jung would understand that as an introverted viewpoint, right? Now, Jung would not really claim in his book that uh, every single person is either an introvert or an extrovert. A lot of the time, a misunderstanding is that he saw the world only in two coins. You're either an introvert or an extrovert. In reality, he saw it as a relative orientation. Some could be significantly introverted, and some moderately introverted, and some slightly introverted. So there were levels and grades and nuances in this. But Jung would argue almost everyone would have some degree of preference and even a small preference, uh, like a few percent over to introversion, over extroversion, would make you an introvert and would change slightly how your course of your life would develop. Because even being just 1% more introverted than extroverted would mean thousands and thousands of hours of extra introverted work for you over the course of your entire life, if that came to be a habitual way for you to think and develop yourself, right? So to be completely balanced is almost impossible because we're constantly tilting in different directions and you'll find that you're constantly moving and shifting between these forces. Some days you'll find that uh, you'll, you'll be more under the influence of the extroverted force and you'll focus on other people, what other people told you, what other people are doing, how you'd like to be more like other people. And sometimes you'll find the introverted one tilting over and you'll be like, yeah, I want to be more interesting. I want to have some unique skills, something that will set me apart from others. I want to follow my own inner compass and live a life that's more aligned with myself, right? And these kind of shifts will happen naturally in every single person. But Sometimes we find ourselves gradually, constantly tilting over to one side, for example, towards int extreme introversion or extreme extroversion. First, it might start out casually. You start hanging out with and socializing more with other people, and you start hearing more and more about others, and all the people you meet are concerned with status and fitting in and social approval, and you want to please them, so you gradually start tipping and slowly shifting over to a more and more extroverted state of mind, to the point where... At some point, it starts taking over your day-to-day -day life and your thoughts to the point where it can feel very unhealthy or even chronic or pathological. So to many, to Young himself, to be a pure introvert or a pure extrovert would be to surrender completely to madness. It would be to completely fall victim to a complete state of bias. You would not be able to appropriately understand or navigate the world as it is. You would have a very biased view of everything that's happening around you. On top of that, Jung would argue that it's hard to type yourself and to say what type you are. First, because types don't exist in the first place and they're merely an approximation or a tool to understand individual psychology. But secondly, because of psychological compensation. So the more introverted we become, the more we develop psychological defenses and excuses and rationalizations and all of these compensations kind of trick our mind and exist to try to help us maintain balance. So the more extreme we become, the more extreme our countermeasures become. Because of course, if you are severely extroverted, that's going to lead to you being a person that who surrenders yourself completely to the object and the object, the world. The only thing that matters to you is money, status, approval, fitting in, being liked by other people, right? And uh, 
the more this happens, the more your psychological psyche becomes unstable. And so what you'll really learn here is that this doesn't work. This is not healthy. And you'll feel the stress and anxiety and all the emotional turmoil of living like that because living like that is going to suck your energy out. It's going to make you absolutely hate yourself and it's going to make you feel like you're a fraud, that you're lying to people, that you're, you know, uh, not never able to be authentic or honest with people. And it's going to be something that deeply troubles you as a person because nobody likes to live in that kind of extreme. And your mind is constantly going to be confronted with this unhealthy, negative turmoil as a result of your extreme preference, right? So um, psychological defenses, they can look a bit like excuses. So an extrovert might say that actually I do need a lot of alone time. And one reason why an extrovert might need a lot of alone time or might say they need a lot of alone time is because uh, when they are around other people, they literally cannot think of themselves and they become so focused on other people and impressing others and making other people laugh and so on that uh, the only way for them to have a chance to even slightly consider themselves and their own feelings is to completely forcibly isolate themselves for short bursts of time. So they'll still be super social, but they'll need to forcibly isolate themselves or they are going to explode at some point and uh, uh, like lose their grip on reality and everything, right? Or they might say, I need to take care of myself. And they will say, well, it's important for me to take care of my own needs because that allows me to make a better impression on other people by having my own skills, my own ideas, my own thoughts. I can impress other people and I can get more status and more popularity. I don't become popular by simply agreeing to everything everyone says and trying to fit in with everyone. Eventually, people are going to see that I don't have anything inside of me. So it's going to be very important for me to have a unique skill that I can use to contribute to the community so that they will like me, right? Or perhaps an introvert might say something like, well, actually, I love to socialize and connect with people, but I don't know anybody interesting enough, right? So what might happen here is that, well, for example they all have this idealized view of how reality should look like. Objective circumstances, you know, should be in, in your own image. So introverts that are extremely introverted tend to develop very strong fantasies and ideas about other people. And for example, they will have an idealized partner and that idealized partner should be perfect in every aspect. They should be the most beautiful, most appeasing, the most moral, the most ethical, the most strong, the most perfect person that can ever exist and walk on this planet. But since such a person doesn't exist in reality, they will feel constantly, chronically dissatisfied with everyone they meet. They will meet people and, you know, nobody will live up to this image. So it will be that, you know, I would love to socialize and connect with the world, but people around me are all stupid, ignorant. Nobody is the way I want them to be. Nobody acts the way I think they should. Nobody lives the life I think they should. Or in the case of a parent, for example, or a mother, it could be that I'm very focused on my family and my kids. Actually, I do care a lot about the objective world. I care about my kids. I care about my family, my partner, right? But perhaps you want your partner to be an extension of yourself. So you want your kids to grow up to be exact copies of yourself. You want them to think, feel, or act the way that you do. You want uh, your partner to be an exact mirror to exactly what you think and you have this kind of compulsion where it's like, you know, they have become a part of your subject. You have kind of made them a part of your own subjective world or how things should be. So you care a lot about the outer world and other people as long as they match up to what you believe that they should look like or behave like, right? So this is what you can learn just from the opening chapters of introversion and extroversion from his general description of the types. And already that is absolutely fascinating because here you can start thinking about the people that you meet or your own psychological world and how you switch and how you can recognize these kind of defensive mechanisms. We all have some of these psychological compensations and defensive mechanisms. And this is why people are so complicated, right? Because it's very easy to, on first glance, through superficial means like body language or physiognomy or quick impression, to say, well, that's such an extrovert, you know, such a shallow, superficial person. But 
every single person has inner depth, uh, just as every person has outer extroverted tendencies. So when you're trying to understand a person, you want to understand how both of these forces coexist. You might see the dominant trait before the inferior trait in a person, but you have to recognize that both are there. And so if you start dating a person or friending a person, you're going to find that while at first they seem like a perfect example of a type that you read about in this book, but the more you get to know them, the more you're going to find that, hey, actually they have a secondary type and a tertiary type that they switch between. When they're with these, this group of people, all of a sudden they're different. And when I saw them with their family, they started acting in another way, right? And here you start to find their different personas. In general, the study of personality is a very extroverted pursuit. You'd think it's an introverted pursuit because it can require self-reflection and a lot of introspection. And of course, it can offer those things. But personality is often a very extroverted pursuit or an idea. In an introverted world, you might see something like, how would I describe it? In an introverted world, character is most important. So it's most important that people are morally good or bad, or that they are strong or weak, for example. But in an extroverted world, it's more important how people appear. So their personality, whether they are charming or funny or engaging or interesting, you know, how the world relates to us versus how we are to the world, right? So what is our character versus what is our personality? So when we are studying personality, we are studying these kind of more superficial traits, like how a person appears to act and what they appears to do. But this book, in general, goes more into the psychology of a person. So what you'll find is that the psychology of a person, what's inside a person, will be very different from what appears on a person. So this book is not really about behavioral psychology. If you're interested in behavioral psychology, understanding the behavior of people, you want to properly study things like the Big Five, which is a very quantifiable instrument that focuses on people's actions and behavior. But if you're trying to understand the psychology of a person, how a person really thinks, this book is super useful because it goes into these kinds of thoughts of the psychology of a person, what is inside. Obviously, a person can act very outgoing and very charming in a specific situation when you meet them at work or in their career. An introverted lawyer that goes in a meeting with a business client has to be very presentable, has to look nice, has to be very friendly, has to be and give a good impression, right? So, of course, in that situation, they might say, seem to be very extroverted. But when you start packing, unpacking their mind and what's really happening inside, you might notice that they have very introverted driving mechanisms inside of them, right? So, for them, it's only important to look nice and give a good impression because for them, they care about being a good lawyer. They want to be competent in their work and their desire for personal competence and significance, their desire to be a star lawyer, or to be, you know, their desire for justice, uh, that drives them towards learning to develop extroverted behavioral mechanisms, like learning to connect with other people and learning to be socially approved and to make a good impression with others. It should also be said that many of these descriptions are of psychologically unhealthy people. So personality psychology is typically the study of healthy variations in behavior. But Carl Jung is primarily focused on the most unhealthy examples or manifestations of a person. So he's interested in the top 5% and the bottom 5% of our civilization, the people that are the most strongly influenced by these kinds of character traits. Because, of course, his work was on patients, patients that had developed psychological traumas and issues and struggles that they had come to him for help with, right? And so you might find that no person is this extreme. No person matches up to these stereotypes that I see in this book. Now, understanding that, uh, it's important to think about how you might manifest these traits. You might want to recognize that, yeah, I don't have this extreme version of... Uh, extroverted thinking that he talks about here, but I do recognize myself in having this kind of orientation in this and this way. So try to write down and think about how you manifest these traits and how you develop to use them. And don't obsess too much about the traditional cognitive function hierarchy, right? So often we tend to get attached to this cognitive function hierarchy of how John B.B believed that the psyche worked. So 
people that came after Jung made f- efforts to kind of categorize functions and to describe to which extent functions manifest in our lives. So if you look at, for example, this way of looking at things, uh, you'd say that, well, functions come in a different order. I have dominant this, I have auxiliary this, I have relief this, and I have aspirational this. But there is no proof that this order actually works, and this theory came quite much later on, and it has never really been validated as a theory. So it's very important to think about, instead, not how do I fit within this structure with a dominant and an inferior, an auxiliary and a tertiary, and how does this relate to me, but rather think about what your own unique structure would look like. Try to think about your own personal relationship to each of the different functions described in the book and how they relate to pertain to your life and try to draw up a map of your own personal landscape. Think about to which extent you give priority to the object and the subject or to the feeling factor or to the thinking factor, to the sensing factor or the intuitive factor and consider when and how these factors become important to you and what emotions they bring up on you from stress to anxiety to flow. If you use this for understanding your own emotional landscape, your feelings, your ability to engage in and experience flow, what Carl Jung called psychic energy, uh, you'll find that this book can be very powerful for your personal development. So you might here get ideas for how you can change your life and your actions and behavior to have more flow. As you might note, this psychological defensive mechanisms uh, exist to maintain a structure or a certain way of thinking, but that way of thinking might not be healthy for you and for your personal development. So you might want to recognize these defensive mechanisms, what they are, crude rationalizations, and often you'll want to think about alternative ways to build a healthier, happier, and more fulfilling life. Carl Jung's goal was individuation psychology. He is an individuation psychologist. He argues for self-actualization. With that, he argues that we should all strive to become our own unique and complicated individuals. You shouldn't try to fit yourself in a certain personal type. You should definitely not try to become one of these types. Imagine reading about the introverted intuition in this book and thinking to yourself, I want to be this person. I want to act like this. This is a terrible person. This person that is described as the introverted intuitive in Jung's book is a very unhealthy and complicated and deeply troubled person. And this person is living a very biased and lost life, stuck in one process, in a bias that helps them or makes them unable to understand the world around them. Obviously, you want to have a complicated view of the world and you want to develop all functions. You want to find your own way of you wielding and using all these functions. And that's not going to mean that you're going to be like everyone else or that you're just going to be some kind of balanced 50-50 person that's just a mix of everything. No, you're going to have your own unique mix in your own unique situations, in your own unique career, in your own unique work and relationships and lifestyle. Because you have your own lifestyle, you're going to have your own way of expressing, developing and manifesting these functions and your own unique relationship to them. And you want a healthy relationship to them. You don't want to look at these functions and think, oh, that's a very awful function. That's an awful way of looking at the world. And nobody should think about the world this way. People should only think about the world my way the way I think about the world. No, you should think, how could this way of looking at the world be useful and helpful to me in my life? How could it add to my richness, to dynamic dynamicity, to uh, growth, to recognize the values and ideas of this type or this function in my own life? So yeah, that's what you should know before you read Carl Jung, Psychological Types. Thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this review, or want help understanding your own personal type, I offer coaching sessions to help you better understand your personality and development. And yeah, that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And see you all in the next video.